One of the most important partnerships that UC Davis has uh, goes back probably six decades at this stage. So Lawrence Livermore and UC Davis have really grown up over, over the last 50 or 60 years or so uh, from, from the establishment of both entities in their current form or close to their current form. So over the last two years, uh, we have spent a lot of time and energy uh, trying to revitalize our partnership between our two institutions. We have uh, developed a joint mentorship program. So we have four graduate students who are co-funded and <coughs> co-mentored uh, with mentors both at Livermore and at UC Davis. Just started in the last few months or so. We've run no fewer than eight uh, faculty to lab researcher workshops both here at Davis and then at Livermore over the last year. Uh, we've generated many common proposals together um, and we continue <coughs> to develop our, our mechanisms of working. So it's a great honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker today who is Dr. Bill Goldstein. Uh, Bill is the 12th director of Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He took up the position around a year or so ago, a little over, I think. Um, he manages a workforce of 6,300 people at Livermore and an annual budget of over 1.5 billion US dollars. He was formerly a deputy director for science and technology. He's been at the lab for, for almost 30 years or so. Uh, he has managed partnerships with academia, uh, with industry and, and other research partners for uh, some, some time at Livermore prior to his appointment as director. Um, he's overseen a broad range of research, uh, including areas in physics, chemistry, optical science, and high energy density science that I think we're going to hear a little bit more of today. He's published over 70 uh, papers um, in fields ranging from particle physics to nuclear physics, X-ray spectroscopy, atomic physics, uh, and plasma physics. So with that, I'll introduce Bill, and uh, thank you again for taking the trip up here today. great honor uh, to uh, be able to address you uh, this morning um, and uh, I don't mind telling you that uh, I'm a little intimidated after uh, the quality of the graduate student talks um, uh, that, I, uh, that I just heard. Um, just a little bit of a warning, there's, um, there's a little bit of a Mac to PC problem, some of the pictures may have disappeared, um, apparently this is a grand challenge that is yet to be addressed. <laughs> I do have an itsy bitsy version of my talk on my, my iPhone so I can fill in uh, uh, in case there's something missing. Um, so uh, I, I'm, uh, uh, let's see, uh, to, oh, by the way, uh, just to uh, uh, explain my uh, title slide a bit, um, in case you uh, don't know the address of uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, uh, you can always refer to the um, periodic table now that uh, Livermoreum has been added uh, to the table as element 116, um, where Laurentium, Livermoreum, Californium, Americium. So you can always find your way um, if your GPS uh, has failed, but your periodic table is available on your phone. Um, so I, 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 uh, I wanted to, I'd, I'd like, of course, to talk about my laboratory this morning um, and about the uh, some of the history, but more really about the opportunities and future for our collaborations. Um, but I wanted to get into the spirit, you know, sort of uh, get into it by talking a little bit about um, the theme, uh, one of the themes of RISE, which is interdisciplinary um, team science. Uh, and uh, so to do that, I, of course, took myself to Google to see what I could uh, learn about it and where it was headed. And, uh, you know, you can, all, you can find just about anything there and indeed. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that's easy to find is a, uh, a, 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 um, a track of the number of authors on papers in scientific fields, and this ranges from uh, medicine to physics. Uh, over the course of the years 1920 to 2010, you can see it pretty much monotonically increasing um, from, uh, um, from just over one, luckily it's not less than one, <laughs> a bad sign. 
to, uh, to just over five. Um, and uh, of course, this is something you could interpret it as um, uh, the uh, increase in team science, uh, uh, larger teams getting together to, uh, to solve problems. Now, what I also found was that uh, what's driving this, what's out in front as usual, um, and I was pleased to see this as my own field, my, my, back, my own background, which is uh, elementary particle physics. Uh, and, and so uh, the, this is the maximum authorship as a function of time over the same number of years. Um, and uh, you can see it, uh, well, slowly growing um, and then shooting up uh, over the last decade or so. Um, and of course the responsibility for that lies with uh, high energy uh, experimental physics the LHC, and uh, the discovery of the Higgs, and yes, the, uh, the, uh, the scale on there is 3,000. Um, definitely big science, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, very, much, uh, very much a team field, and again, um, sort of the frontiers of physics as usual uh, leading the way. Now, I'm not a physics chauvinist, uh, but I will tell you that um, uh, when I was uh, training as a, um, a graduate student, I, I was a actually uh, being trained in theoretical particle physics, and this, well, this is a rather solitary field. Uh, in fact, uh, my first um, three papers were single author affairs. Um, even my uh, thesis advisor didn't add his name to the papers. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, on the other hand, my, uh, my experimental physics colleagues, in particular the particle physicists, uh, were even then, and this is, we're going back uh, more than 30 years now, um, were even then uh, participating in teams of tens, uh, at least tens of scientists uh, in the, uh, on the publication list of their papers. Um, uh, but of course, they were uh, essentially the, uh, the uh, spiritual followers or, or uh, legatees of, of, uh, of a man named Ernest Lawrence, uh, who uh, invented the first, uh, who was really the inventor of the cyclotron, um, one of the first atom splitters, and in fact one of the first people to, uh, to split the nucleus and to study uh, sub, uh, subnuclear physics. Um, and uh, uh, Lawrence, in fact, um, at least in legend or, or in myth, uh, is one of the originators, one of the people who defined uh, big science, uh, team science, and interdisciplinary science um, from his, uh, his perch at, uh, um, at, at UC Berkeley. And um, he really is uh, one of the um, uh, spiritual fathers, in fact, the founder, and certainly a, uh, a spiritual father of the, uh, of the way that, uh, that we do business at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which which I am now the director of. So just just to go back to my the arc of my career from writing single author papers to running a laboratory uh, that is um, the, uh, uh, the, um, the 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 that's been in, that's been informed inspired uh, by by Lawrence's vision of uh, team science and big science. Um, it's been quite a journey. It's very interesting for me um, and. Uh, um, you know, over the course of the years, um, I've become actually a true believer in the importance and the value uh, of teaming, of working interdisciplinarily, and uh, 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 in order to solve problems. So, um, just to uh, kind of uh, re repeat it, the the, uh, the laboratory uh, is informed by uh, by Lawrence and uh, other founders from the UC from the University of California. Um, we are about large scale science. That means really the biggest um, and most powerful uh, scientific tools uh, being applied to problems, um, doing it with interdisciplinary uh, teams, um, and having a, a national impact, having a real impact, real world impact, solving real problems. I, these are, uh, 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 I, I think, uh, just listening to the talks this morning, these, are, these themes are are resonant and, and uh, um, I hear echoed within the, uh, very strongly within the RISE program. So um, this is a, a, a bit of a description of our lab. The, the, uh, uh, the big national programs that we tend to solve are in national security, we're a multidisciplinary national security national laboratory, founded in 1952, uh, about 6,000 employees on a square mile. 
Um, by the way, that's pretty compact. Um, and I, I always like to, uh, I, I, I actually believe that one of the reasons we are so successful at working interdisciplinarily is the compactness of the site and the fact that we, it tends to support uh, uh, both random collisions uh, between scientists and, and uh, the ability uh, to uh, not have to travel great distances to, uh, to work with your colleagues. I, I think it actually works out that way. And a uh, uh, federal budget about one and a half billion dollars, mostly um, from, the, uh, from the federal government. Um, now, um, I said our mission is uh, primarily national security. Um, the way that we, uh, we carry out this mission um, is through multidisciplinary science, technology, and engineering. And this chart here is um, both a, uh, um, a, uh, uh, an abstraction of the lab and, and in some sense also an organization chart for the laboratory. Um, our major mission areas are in nuclear security, uh, international and domestic security, um, uh, 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 counterterrorism, um, ca um, uh, infrastructure protection, cybersecurity, things like that. Uh, energy and environmental security, and uh, our ability to carry out these missions, to carry out programs and solve problems in these areas is uh, fundamentally based on a strong base of science, engineering, and computing. And the way that this works, and I alluded to it a bit, I'm talking about the geography of the site. Uh, this is a way of alluding to it in the organization of the laboratory, um, is by bringing together teams from our science organization, our engineering organization, um, and our computing organization uh, to solve problems um, in, in, in each of these mission areas. And the, the, actually the way to think about it is um, there, there would be a problem to solve, a program, a, 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 a research uh, endeavor. Um, the, a team will be brought together um, based on uh, each of these areas from each of these organizational areas um, into the particular problem area to solve it, and then it will disband when it's, uh, when it's been solved, and uh, uh, new problems will arise that require a new team interaction. Um, so uh, this is just a, a, a sort of a catalog of the capabilities that, uh, um, that uh, we draw on at the laboratory, um, and uh, um, I, won't, uh, I won't read them in detail. Um, you can take a look at them. Um, they're uh, uh, really dominated uh, by, by science, by computing, uh, and by engineering. And uh, um, uh, we, these, are, these are the things that we, have, we uh, keep in a strong state at the lab in order to solve these problems. Now the other thing that we rely on very strongly, obviously, to do our work and to do it well is uh, uh, our people. Um, and uh, the laboratory has a highly qualified multidisciplinary uh, technical workforce. Um, uh, and, you can, and highly degree, and you can see here, for example, that there are 1,200 PhD scientists and engineers on the site, um, a large number of degrees, and you can also see um, how they divide up uh, by uh, discipline, if you will, um, with um, uh, physics and uh, computational sciences uh, kind of dominating, and, and, and we, uh, uh, we, we often say that uh, Livermore is a physics lab, but you can see that uh, uh, the other fields actually uh, contribute large numbers of people. And in fact, the laboratory is dominated by engineers. Uh, an interesting point, which I think actually gets to the fact that um, while the work that we do runs from basic research all the way through uh, applied research and, and actually building things, um, the uh, uh, this, this idea of, of actually um, giving uh, um, uh, a body or giving a cor 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 actually bringing ideas to fruition and getting them uh, to the point where they have a real impact um, dominates the laboratory and it's one of the reasons why engineering is uh, one of the largest uh, disciplines. Now, um, this uh, uh, came up just earlier. Um, the, uh, the way we get one of the the way we get this workforce, one of the dominant ways that we get this um, uh, excellent, highly credentialed workforce is from the University of California. This connection has been strong, it's been historic, and, uh, and, and continues today. Um, and what you're looking at here is uh, uh, the distribution of degrees um, at the lab, 
Uh, in, uh, in orange, you can see highlighted the degrees that come to us, um, the, the degree scientists and engineers who come to us from the University of California. And uh, if I look very closely, yes, yes, UC Davis is actually in the lead. Um, <laughs> In fact, more than 30% of the more scientists and engineers have UC uh, degrees. Uh, right now, uh, almost a quarter of, our, of the postdocs that we have, and we have about uh, 150 to 160 postdocs, um, come from the University of California. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, over the years, the 10 UC campuses, uh, we talked about collaborations, or collaborations were mentioned between uh, UC, UC Davis in particular, and the laboratory consistently co author 30 to 40% of uh, of all Livermore publications. Now, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the mission of the lab and what we do there. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the principal mission, as I mentioned, is nuclear security uh, and support uh, to the strategic deterrent of the U.S. Um, uh, a large piece of that is what's called the Stockpile Stewardship Program. And this is the program that's designed to, um, uh, to uh, uh, maintain our uh, nuclear deterrent um, in, in the face of um, these weapons being uh, uh, available or, or extant throughout the world. Now, sometimes um, uh, this uh, this mission it does not always go over particularly all that well with uh, with everybody, um, but it's very important, I think, to bear in mind several things. First of all, um, the U.S. Uh, as a policy is committed to global zero, driving these weapons to zero, and this is um, very much uh, part of the mission that the laboratory contributes to. But as long as they, of course, exist throughout the world, it's important to have a, a, a deterrent um, that is known to work. And remember, these weapons, these systems can never be tested, cannot be tested again. Since 1992, we've obeyed a, a testing moratorium. We cannot test these, uh, these systems. Um, it's uh, absolutely essential to be able to understand that they're reliable, to be able to actually certify that they're reliable and safe, despite the, ability, the fact that we can't test it. Um, this is, in fact, a grand challenge, a scientific grand challenge, to carry this out as these systems age and uh, do things that they were never expected or predicted to do uh, just by sitting around. Um, and it's this grand challenge that uh, is one of the biggest things that we address at the laboratory. Um, the uh, bottom line, uh, the Stockpile Stewardship Program has successfully maintained the nuclear deterrent um, since 1992 without ever being able to test um, uh, the systems that are part of the deterrent. Um, this is really a science problem, and as I said, a grand challenge science problem. It's based, as all science is, on challenging predictions with experiments, and it, it really does underlie the reason why um, some of our biggest facilities, uh, most powerful scientific uh, um, capabilities are at the lab. First of all, high-performance computing, modeling, and simulation is exemplified at uh, Livermore by Sequoia, the Sequoia computer, um, which is, uh, uh, just noting here, that it's the third most powerful computer in the world. It was first for several years, now third. By the way, the first, the most powerful computer on the list is in China, uh, interestingly enough. Um, uh, we also actually remain at the uh, very top of the Graph 500 list, which is a, uh, a list that tests or uh, rates computers according to their ability uh, and power at doing uh, data analytics, uh, a, a topic that's actually part of, very much part of the RISE uh, program, as I, I discovered. Um, we're also at the very top of the Green 500 list, which is the set of the most um, uh, ecologically sound or, or um, uh, 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 least get ecologically impactful computers in the world. Um, again, uh, I think the line pretty much with the, with the theme of the RISE uh, uh, campaign. Um, the, uh, the, the physics or the science that we do with this computer, which tends to be very large scale simulations of very complex multi science problems, uh, um, physics and chemistry coming together. Uh, requires experimental challenge and validation, um, and that's done on experimental facilities and in particular on the National Ignition Facility, uh, which is the largest and most powerful um, laser in the world, uh, used to explore extremes of energy, temperature, and pressure. Uh, in fact, physical conditions that can't be reached any place else on Earth now, now that we don't do nuclear tests, um, and really only occur um, in, uh, um, in, in 
cosmology and objects in the universe, stars um, and planets. Um, I, I just want to note that, uh, as you probably know, um, computer science or computers, computer technology turns over very quickly, gets faster very quickly. Um, I mentioned to you that Sequoia was the fastest, most powerful machine, fastest machine in the world several years ago, now it's third. Um, actually, uh, computer architectures are sort of running at, into a, a bit of a wall now in terms of getting more powerful. And the next step is going to be a significant change in the way um, that uh, parallel computing is done. Um, and that next step will be taken by Livermore. It was, uh, um, it was uh, uh, announced by the Secretary of Energy just a few months ago that the uh, so-called Coral Collaboration, uh, which stands for Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore, um, will be fielding um, the next um, 100 plus petaflop uh, computer. Sequoia was a 20 petaflop machine. Uh, at Livermore in the 2017 to 2018 time frame. Um, thus, basically, uh, w w this is the path forward for leadership and computing uh, for the lab. Um, now, NIF, as I mentioned, is a, is a, uh, a, a, a powerful instrument uh, for doing science at the extremes, the extremes of temperature or pressure. Uh, this is a field that's called high energy density science. Um, and uh, uh, the power of NIF is actually being demonstrated at, uh, really right as we speak, um, very much in partnership with the University of California. Um, this is a, uh, a um, uh, cover uh, story that appeared in Nature over the summer, um, demonstrating the compression uh, of, uh, of, of diamond um, to uh, conditions uh, that are pressures that are so high they're only found in the center of Jupiter, or they are found in the center of Jupiter. Um, and um, this, uh, the emergence of the ability to do things that have never been done before, like create these pressures, has really generated, um, a, uh, in my view, a new field of science, a very interdisciplinary field of science. It's high energy density science that combines um, condensed matter science, uh, plasma physics, astrophysics, um, uh, atomic physics, uh, chemistry at unique conditions, at, at very high pressure conditions, um, combines them all, looks, it gives us windows into all of these uh, uh, um, uh, new uh, fields looking at the extremes of matter. Um, and uh, it's a field that's uh, really exploding right now, and I just wanted to, oh, I actually, uh, um, I have a, uh, I did want to uh, just note that, uh, what's that? Oops, what do I want to do? There's, there's a movie in there. But um, I am not succeeding with it. Um, so anyway, um, the, uh, uh, that was just uh, Mary Gilley, who's the uh, president of the uh, Academic Senate, speaking before the regions about that experiment, which um, involved UC participation. No. I don't know the right time. Teaching and learning technologies. Other academics, both in UC and beyond, use these creative products in teaching their own students. Let me offer you a not particularly unusual example. At a meeting of the Maybe Academic Senate Committee example. on the National Labs, we learned about a publication in Nature. Ron Sashadri, a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UC Santa Barbara, who is on the committee, decided to look up the article. It was such a great paper that he used it to prepare slides for a class session on pressure effects on, on materials. Ron says, I use the slides to describe the work in a class as a monster experiment in high pressure science. Basically, the authors, who include a Berkeley professor and a Lawrence Livermore National Lab scientist, have compressed diamond to pressures that exceed those of the center of the Earth and even of Saturn. To be a little more fanciful, when compressed, the diamonds weigh more than lead. No other facility than the National Ignition Facility in the world could achieve this. The research done at UC and one of, the, uh, one of our national labs inspired Ron to share it with his students to illustrate what what large-scale facilities and university lab partnerships make possible. Research that would, not very many years ago, have been beyond the realm of our wildest, wildest imagination. UC faculty present their work at conferences where academics from UC and 
This, uh, this field of high energy density science is, uh, as I said, an emerging discipline. This is, uh, there have been actually a number of uh, um, reports uh, sponsored by uh, the NRC um, and uh, um, other uh, um, uh, agent and government agencies looking at uh, uh, how to move it forward. But really, it's only over the last several years that it's, it's just taken off incredibly. And I just have a few examples. I'm going to flash through. Um, this is another high pressure experiment that was done at, at NIF, uh, um, looking at uh, the properties of minerals at extremely high, at high pressures, planetary interior conditions, um, leading to new uh, kinds of hypotheses and conclusions, particularly here, the possibility um, that uh, liquid silicates at high pressure uh, might be able to contribute to magnetic, magnetic field generation in super Earth exoplanets. So again, starting to give us a window into um, uh, planets uh, that are being discovered now uh, more and more often um, outside our own solar system. Um, we've also shown that we can do precision nuclear physics measurements um, under these kinds of conditions. And um, uh, remember, these are the, actually the, the conditions in these high uh, temperature density plasmas that nuclear synthesis is taking place in, in the universe. Um, most nuclear physics measurements are made in accelerators where you have, don't have the plasma physics going on, the complications. In fact, the interdisciplinary um, uh, science that's going on that you can explore at, uh, uh, in, the, in the high energy density conditions, plasmas that are uh, created at NIF. Um, and here's just demonstration that we can, we can actually do precision measurements there. Um, uh, uh, very complex uh, plasma experiments, in this case colliding plasmas. This uh, work actually done at Rutherford Laboratory just published in 2015 um, in, uh, in Nature Physics with a, uh, with a commentary associated with it, uh, showing uh, uh, signatures of an instability that has been hypothesized uh, to lead to some of the highest energy, uh, highest energy uh, transient events uh, in the universe, uh, the so-called rival instability. Um, I want to turn out, talk about some of the other areas. Oh, by the way, I should just mention, um, as, as, uh, um, as Paul mentioned, um, high energy density physics is one of the areas where there's a, a growing collaboration with a number of campuses across UC, uh, including a very strong one that's, uh, that's ongoing um, with UC Davis, uh, and is one of the areas that uh, I, I believe um, will be a, a, a growing, will represent growing connections between the laboratory um, and the UC Davis campus. Um, the, um, and I wanted to mention some other areas in this, uh, uh, in this vein, some of which have come up already today. Uh, big data, data analytics, and the application to real world problems is something um, that we are using, by the way, our, uh, we are investing a fair amount of our own uh, RISE-like funds, internal investment funds, um, in uh, uh, to try to um, bring uh, the uh, uh, newest work on uh, big data analytics um, to the kinds of problems, real world problems that we face. We heard a little bit, actually fascinating uh, examples of that this morning. Um, this is an example of using it uh, for a, uh, a capability at the laboratory that uh, allows um, uh, intelligence analysts and, uh, and actually um, uh, uh, officers in the field uh, to make queries to a database about weapons of mass destruction, um, capabilities that might exist uh, that they have to worry about, facilities, for example, in the field that might be um, uh, in a country that they're working in, um, uh, what might be at that facility, what it might represent in terms of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, threats. Um, uh, this database is growing uh, incredibly, um, 20,000 new records a day. These are records that are both structured and unstructured. Heard a little about that this morning. Um, many of them are real text, uh, many of them are video, many of them are, uh, have, are, it's a very heterogeneous kind of data, set of data. Um, and uh, that, so this capability has to, actually has to move from sort of a keyword search kind of basis to something that allows people to query it um, uh, in a much more, uh, um, a much more uh, uh, sophisticated way. Um, so we're moving towards uh, uh, being able to use science-based model queries of this system, uh, one of the approaches to taking advantage of uh, big data uh, databases. Um, and from there, actually, to uh, applying uh, some of the most uh, uh, advanced, uh, 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 advanced, some of the most recent advances in uh, machine learning. Um, to be able to have the system actually learn what the right question should be uh, to, uh, uh, to assist 
uh, again, solving this problem for people actually worried about it. Um, uh, another area is uh, that uh, we work together, and I think is, a, uh, is, is an area uh, to continue to grow is in earth sciences uh, um, and climate. Uh, the laboratory has, uh, for a long time, been a leader in climate science. In fact, uh, the very first global circulation models uh, that were ever put together were done at the lab. These global cir circulation models are the forerunners of today's um, uh, climate models, global climate models, uh, put together at the lab in order to study uh, the pro uh, problems of fallout uh, distribution and, uh, and the hypothe hypothesis of nuclear winter. These led directly to the, the global uh, climate models we have today. And the lab has actually remained a, had maintained a significant role in climate modeling um, and evaluating climate models for the Department of Energy and for the International, the IPCC, the International Organization for with Climate Change. This is a series of papers actually over the last year, all three of which appeared on the cover of, uh, of their journals, um, looking at the impact of volcanoes, some things that hadn't been looked at before on, on climate change, particularly over the last 13 years uh, of the so-called morning hiatus. Um, uh, and finally, in the area of medical and biosciences, this is a long-standing area of collaboration between uh, UC Davis and the lab. Uh, there's a new, new partnership actually that looks at improving cancer care by applying accelerated mass spectrometry, a um, highly precise and accurate way of measuring very, very small quantities uh, of, uh, of, uh, of chemicals um, and, uh, and, um, and isotopes. Um, applying that to personalized medicine in cancer care. The idea here is to be able to test before putting a person on a, uh, on a regimen of, for example, chemotherapy, whether they're responsive to that chemotherapy before actually going through the whole process using microdosing, providing very, very small amounts of the, of the uh, therapeutic agent and using the high precision measurement to be able to detect the response of the body to that very, very small amount. Um, if it's successful, and this is now funded uh, by uh, uh, the NIH. Uh, if successful, this will really uh, revolutionize the, uh, uh, and, uh, the, the and lead to very important ways to the personalization of, of uh, cancer care. So I, as I mentioned, UC Davis and Lamar have a continuing and historically rich engagement. This has come up several times this morning. Um, UC Davis faculty and graduate students are on 800 co-authored publications with Livermore over the last five years. There, we have uh, 29 graduate students currently conducting uh, PhD thesis research at the lab. We have a program called the Lawrence Scholarship Program um, at the lab, which is competitive across, uh, across the country, and uh, um, almost 20% of the participants in that program come from UC Davis. Uh, we've partnered um, in uh, uh, an NSF Center on Biophotonic Science and Technology and continue to partner uh, in the uh, National Cancer Institute uh, National Cancer Center at Davis, which, by the way, is the umbrella for the uh, personalized medicine work I mentioned. Now, I could go through all the things that we do, which is kind of what's here, um, but I'd like to actually, I think what I'll do is close. Oh, I, I should boast just a little bit. Um, it, it, you know, uh, the, uh, many places put out a top 10 list. Uh, it turns out that APS, the American Physical Society, puts out a top 10 list. Uh, a list of physics news stories in 2014, and actually two of those, so two of ten, um, were, uh, were Livermore, uh, basically based on Livermore accomplishments. One was a milestone in the uh, attempt to demonstrate fusion in the laboratory, and the other had to do with a verification experiment for the discovery of element 117. I mentioned 116 to you. That same collaboration that discovered 116 actually discovered a number of other elements. Uh, of course, you don't actually get to be on the periodic table until someone does a confirm, actually several confirmatory experiments are done. And then, by the way, a very complicated um, deliberative process internationally by the International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry takes place over several years uh, to secure your place. Um, uh, element 117 this year was confirmed in an experiment at Darmstadt. This was, again, discovered by uh, scientists at Livermore in collaboration with Russians. Uh, so that's one of the other uh, top 10 stories. Uh, this is the little morning story. I want to actually close, if I could, with uh, one way of uh, showing you um, the things that we do. See how many of you get these right. Our contestants at the beginning of
of last week started off quickly, just as is the case today. But Jen, with 3,600, you get to pick first from these categories in Double Jeopardy. Philosophy, top five hit makers, a whole category about dinosaurs. What a country. There be three Bs in each correct response. And finally, the science of security from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where technology that makes Americans safer also improves our daily lives. Back to you, Mike. Science of security 400, please. Here's Sarah. National security, as well as national wealth, would be enhanced with safe, boundless energy from this process that powers the sun. One approach involves a powerful laser working like a spark plug. Mike, what is fusion? Fusion, that's it. Uh, security 800. Sorry again. A new military uniform material under development protects personnel from chemical or biological weapons using CNTs, or these nanotubes, which close up like tiny pores during an attack. Mike, what is carbon? Carbon, yes. Security 12, please. Jimmy this time. Keeping satellites safe is the goal of the STAIR project which can predict the orbit of thousands of pieces of space junk to within 100 meters using tiny satellites positioned in LEO, short for this. Mike again. What is low Earth orbit? Yes. Security for 16, please. Back to Jimmy. A device to detect radioactivity at ports of entry is called Gemini, many for its size and GE for this element, whose semiconducting properties and high atomic number make it a great detector material. Jen. What is germanium? That's it. Mike. Uh, security for 2000, please. Back to Sarah. The lab's high performance computing with the capacity of 20 quadrillion operations per second is not just helping to build weapon systems, but to model this, which Secretary of State Kerry in 2014 called directly related to the potential of greater conflict. And this time the correct response is climate. Change. Less than a minute to go now, Mike. That was a tough one. Given that aired about two weeks ago, I hope some of you uh, um, caught it. Um, it's as good a summary as any I did of the, of the range of things that are going on at the lab. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much.